Thanks, Katie. <laughs> All right, so today's training um, is going to be a little heavy on information right at the beginning, and then we're going to have a couple different activities that everyone will participate in in breakout rooms as we go. Okay, we're just going to start with some overview information. So the purpose of today is to enhance language access needs for sexual assault survivors um, and ensure service, services are accessible, all of your services statewide. The beginning of a much longer process, as Katie said. It's important that we learn about language access um, because it's needed statewide, it's needed every single place in the state of Maine. Um, people are federally protected by the Civil Rights Act, and it's important that we provide culturally affirming services and services in someone's chosen language is a very big part of ensuring that that happens. So like I said, my background is in immigration work and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about immigration in Maine and why this is something that's important statewide. So right now in Maine, immigrants make up about 4% of Maine's population. That's a number that's growing every single year. Um, and about 7% of all residents here um, are folks who have been born here, but have at least one immigrant parent. So I think that sometimes in many parts of the state, I'm from central Maine, um, so this is definitely true for me, that immigration can feel like it's only in a couple different parts of the state, but it really is something that is statewide and in every single county in, in Maine. Um, to give just an example of the scope of this, these are some numbers from our interpretation program pre-pandemic, because I think it speaks better to um, the numbers of folks who need language support in our state. Um, so our service, which is one of many interpretation services, in 2019, got over 18,000 requests in 36 languages in every single county, which is about 90 hours of interpretation scheduled a day. So there is huge demand for language support. Um, and again, in every county in Maine, we're not just providing services in Portland, we're not just providing them in Lewiston, this is everywhere in the state. And this is just for me, it's hard to get a sense for the scope of need. Um, and so this is just our service as one example. So um, in Maine, um, there are a number of, you're probably serving folks with a number of different immigration statuses, but it is true that Maine has a really high, a very high percentage of Maine's immigrants are refugees and asylees. Um, a refugee is just is someone who can't return to their home country because of a well-founded fear of persecution. So in Maine, my agency is the only refugee resettlement agency, and we are resettling, you know, depending on federal administration, um, between 100 and 700 people a year that have refugee status. That means they're coming from a refugee camp overseas. Maine also has a lot of people who come here as asylum seekers. These are also folks who are fleeing persecution, but they come to the United States a different way, um, either crossing a border or coming here on a different visa and then applying for permanent status or refugee status. I think this context is important because it means that a lot of people who need language access support are coming to this country fleeing persecution. So it just adds another layer of the background of why language access and why it's really vital. So these numbers um, are, again, just an example from the program that I work in, but I think it gives you a good snapshot of where people are coming from um, and what languages we have here, right? So the countries represented you see across the board are maybe the countries where the most people are coming from um, in, the, in the state of Maine, but the languages represented within this group over the last five years or over 20 languages. Um, so folks' language needs are diverse um, and people are from many, many different places all over the world. Um, although refugee resettlement is concentrated in some main cities, in past years we've done resettlement in Augusta, in Biddeford, um, even some family ties that have been in Ellsworth or Brunswick, and it is expanding, absolutely. All right, so 
that's why you know language access is needed statewide but we're going to talk a little bit about what that means and what it is so um, it's title six of the civil rights act um, that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race color and national origin and language is covered under national origin in this act it's important to know that because it means that any program receiving federal financial assistance, even indirectly, um, needs to give folks meaningful access to that program. So people, regardless of their national origin, need to be able to participate in the program. Um, you know, another way to say that is that any policies or practices um, can't deny people with limited English proficiency equal access to a federally funded program, which they're qualified for. So this is like the law version, but the practice of that, and I'm sure you see this when you work with federally funded programs, is pretty different. So we're gonna talk about both. So again, anybody who receives federal support, even indirectly, is supposed to provide language access. However, the way that this is written is that folks must take reasonable steps to ensure that people have meaningful access. The definition of meaningful um, is supposed to be that language assistance is provided, uh, that is provided as accurate, timely, effective, and free. But I see this all the time, and I'm sure you do also, that um, agencies are at a lot of different steps and stages along the way towards meaningful access. And sometimes it's just because people are new to language access, like let's say, you know, we're resettling people in a new school district who's never worked with refugee kids before, and they don't know how to utilize interpreters because they haven't had to. It's their job to be taking meaningful or reasonable steps towards ensuring those folks have access. Um, so we know that even though it's the law to provide it, uh, people are at different stages again along this journey. And there, are, there isn't, in Maine at this moment, a lot of recourse, you know, if you are working with a federal agency and they aren't providing language access. So education like today is really what we have to get folks to be moving along this path. And I, I imagine folks know, but just to underline it, um, we all receive federal funding and not even indirectly, very directly. <laughs> very directly. <laughs> all okay, of our great. work is the federal, <laughs> the federal funding. <laughs> Um, so it's important both, um, we talk about sort of compliance reasons to do things and ethical reasons to do things. And so both they land, this land squarely in both for, for sexual assault support centers. Thanks, Katie. That's really helpful. At the, I receive federal funding very directly also, um, from the office of refugee resettlement. And there are absolutely times that we still could do better at this, at our program. Um, Okay, so a few other basics about what language access is just for the rest of our training. So interpretation and translation are not the same thing. And it's really important that um, providers know the difference um, because the skills are really different from each other. And that's one of the reasons that difference matters. So interpretation is spoken. So it's the process of changing spoken words from one language to another and translation is written. And it's the process of changing a written message from one language to another. Um, usually the prime example I give of why this is important is that someone who has been trained in interpretation has passed all of the tests, has worked for years, um, very well might not have the same written skills or um, have been certified as a translator. And I see it happen all the time that an interpreter will be asked to Site translate, right? Like maybe be given a giant consent form in front of them and be asked to read it in another language, right? So let's say the consent form is in English and the provider will say, you know, can you translate this, right? And the skill of reading in one language and speaking it in another is not the same skill as verbal translation of hearing one language and speaking it in another, right? So many interpreters are also translators, but it's not the same job. And I think that can be a big challenge when someone is actually in an interpreter role 
And that's why I think the difference matters a lot. So mostly the role of an interpreter, so again, spoken, one language to another, is that they're a conduit, right? The role is to be in between the source language and the target language and to interpret exactly what is being said. That is mostly the role of the interpreter. In almost all scenarios, that should be the role. Um, but a second role that interpreters occasionally play is a clarifier. So an example is if a provider has given a message, it has been interpreted, and the client is confused about the message, it would be okay for the interpreter to say, you know, the interpreter has noticed that the client doesn't understand, could you say it a different way? Right, so the interpreter also can help clarify. These two top roles in the pyramid, being a cultural broker or an advocate, really should not be the role of the interpreter unless it is absolutely vital, right? And we're gonna, in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about that more. But the interpreter's job is being a conduit or being a clarifier. Um, when I was prepping with Fatuma, we talked about this a lot, that interpreters are not the same as folks who are multilingual or bilingual and advocates um, for a lot of reasons. Um, but we're going to go through a few of them, and then I'd be happy to hear from folks if you think I'm missing things. So, interpreter is a conduit. Their job is to relay information, their number one job. Um, it's not their role to act as an advice giver or advocate. They're really supposed to be neutral and only be passing information. They shouldn't be providing transportation, and they don't have access to survivor information. Right? And that's a really important difference too. So multilingual advocates absolutely speak multiple languages too. They have that in common <laughs> with interpreters. Um, but their job is to be an advocate. They can provide cultural brokering services, right? So maybe explain like a cultural difference they notice or a moment where the provider and their survivor are missing each other and understanding. Um, sometimes transportation could be provided. Um, they have a legal release, oops, sorry, a legal release for sharing information um, and they're service providers. And that's really different from an interpreter. Um, it can be really tough when a advocate or in my case, a case manager is put in the role of being an interpreter um, because it's hard to blend the job of advocating and passing information and those aren't the same job. Right. And I, as someone who works in a field and interpreters constantly, I absolutely know that there are times people are put in that scenario. But kind of like Katie said in the beginning, um, what we're talking about today are best practices. So it's the best practice that those roles are different. Um, does anybody on the call, and I know that there are some multilingual providers on the call, um, think that I'm missing anything? between these two roles or things that you need to add that are relevant to your work. Yeah, Hannah, what do you say? Hi. Hi, Norta, how are you? <laughs> Hi, good, good, good. Yeah, um, like, um, I am one of the translators for Catholic Data, and I also work with uh, IFCM yeah. um, as a reputation. Um, all what you said is like we, you know, during the interpreter training, um, and I have been translating for a long time. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what we always learn. And, you know, we were taught like um, interpreters are not, you know, advocates. They are uh, conveying the message from the provider to the client and, and you know, and clarify. Like we can clarify if, you know, if I see that the client is not understanding or not, or even myself as a translator, if I, like, if someone is not a medical interpreter and they don't have that, if they have, you know, the terms, they're not understanding the medical terms, you know, um, asking clarification to make sure that, you know, um, it's accurate translated to the client and they best understand. So, um, so I, I have done that a lot before and, you know, um, and all would you say that, you know, um, just interpreters are only, you know, clarifiers and conveying the message. Yeah. 
advocate. I always leave my advocate half when I'm translating. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Marta. That's so clear. I'm really glad you spoke up about your dual role that you have there and how, right, it's like two different hats you have to put on. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> And I don't know if anyone else um, wants to speak up, but one of the things this, our new policy does is clarify what does it look like when you have a staff member who is multilingual and is going to act as an interpreter <clears throat> and how you assess <clears throat> that their interpretation skills are at the level of being an interpreter and that when they do so, they will not be acting as an advocate. So, for example, if um, Casey were fluent in Spanish and had gone through the process with her employer to show credentialing for being able to be an interpreter, and Caitlin was working with someone who spoke Spanish, and there was an agreement that Casey could be the interpreter for this client, but Caitlin would remain the advocate, and Casey would be acting in the role of interpreter happen to be at work and getting paid for that time. Um, so does that make sense? So there's definitely been a lot of um, work around best practice when it comes to having multilingual staff and when they're an interpreter and when they're an advocate. Yeah. So we can continue to dive into those examples and it's written out in the policy, but it's other, those are things we can continue to chat about as we, as we think about um, using interpreters right. and using multilingual staff. Thank you so much, Katie. That's really helpful and also brings up another point around just skills, which is that, you know, I have a huge number of staff that speak French, um, but absolutely not all of them should interpret just because they are different levels of French speakers. Um, you know, and speaking, you know, French from learning it in college is really helpful if you're building trust with a client and building relationships but less helpful if you're in a medical setting. And it's really important that there's an interpreter there that's getting all of the information exactly correct. Yeah, thank you both for those examples. Um, Hi. Hi, I can't quite see who's talking, but hello. Oh, Ozia. Hi, Hi, how are you? <laughs> Ozia Roble from IRCM. I just wanna add um, a little point of uh, Sometimes when we accompany uh, as advocates, uh, we have some difficulties and then a provider assume that you are here for interpreting and sometimes they even uh, cancel their, or, their own interpreter and, or they, they don't understand that if you are, you are here, you're not here to interpret it for them. Yeah. And it's always difficult. And we had to explain, give, uh, show them the, the release. Uh, even though we, we show uh, the release, they even ask, ask the client the, the, uh, if, you know, and they don't accept, then we can speak for the client or explain the client uh, things yeah. differently. And it's difficult uh, to show and, and make them accept that we are part of uh, the support system of this uh, client. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just then as soon as they see you, they assume that you are not an advocate. And it's, we, that's an extra thing that we always have to explain, show, prove ourselves. Uh, yeah. And, really frustrating Fasir. and it's, it is frustrating sometimes and that's we are we are here to help the, our uh, clients and so we support a lot of burden on that yeah sometimes we are forced to 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 play the interpreter because uh, they even cancel their own interpreter sometimes right. absolutely and one of the things that's really important about doing trainings with this group is i think for this coalition, it's really important to be able to support your colleagues and, you know, all of your partners and be clarifying that role and being very clear with that, you know, Kelsey is saying she's had to do a lot of self-advocacy in the moment about what her job is. Um, and it also is the role of folks like me and Fatuma when we're doing trainings with providers to really push that education of providers knowing the difference um, so that you can do your role you can play you can and you don't have to play two at the same time like Norta's saying and both hats yeah 
Thank you for clarifying that so clearly. Um, I'm gonna just do a little bit more on some basics of working with interpreters and before we get to our first activity together, you do a little practice. Um, so there's some things that you can do as a provider before you work with interpreters. So just make sure that uh, you're getting the service that the client needs. Um, it's important to ask, ask what language folks prefer to receive information in. So, you know, a lot of clients may speak a number of languages, but what language they prefer to receive information is, is maybe one way to ask what is the preferred language. Um, you can ask about the gender and age of the interpreter or that the client would prefer for the interpreter. Um, some folks prefer phone interpretation service because it might feel more anonymous, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You could ask if folks prefer phone, video, or in person. Um, it can be helpful to ask about second languages or preferred dialects to really make sure that um, you're getting the correct interpreter assigned. And you can ask if folks have any barriers or concerns around community relationships or family ties. Um, they really don't want an interpreter that they know, or they really don't want an interpreter from their area, um, or what other boundaries people have around who is their assigned interpreter. And then I find something that's really important too is explaining really clearly confidentiality norms for your program and agency and how interpreters are also bound to that as well. And that's really important to folks to know, for folks to know. So briefly on phone, video, and in person. So, you know, over the phone interpreting is on demand. Um, so we use it, you know, if someone walks into the office and has a question, it's a good example of when you might use it. Um, really what to know about it is that um, you just need to be ready to go with the information that you need available when you call the call language line, whatever the service is. And your organization should have some kind of code and you're gonna to need to know the name of the person you're working with and the preferred language of the person you're working with and really have that all ready. You can use over the phone interpreting, you know, when you're sitting next to someone and you wanna use it together and you also can initiate a three-way call. You just have to let them know up front. And the service know, like right when you call, you have to let the service know. So that's really phone interpretation again is on demand. It's, it can be feel more anonymous to the survivor or the clients because you know the phone interpretation company is national, so interpreters are from everywhere, um, and you can do it last minute. That's a big bonus. Um, video interpreters can jump into Zoom meetings now, which is great. Um, we use them a lot through WhatsApp, which we find to be very accessible to clients, and that's another big plus of video. It's helpful to still see facial expressions and body language. And one thing about video now is there are both companies that can be on demand, which you might have seen if you're in a hospital. A lot of hospitals use on demand video interpreting, um, but you also can schedule video interpreting. Um, so if you know a meeting ahead of time, absolutely can do video. Um, Another thing that is great about video is that Zoom now does have the ability to utilize more than one interpreter at once on different channels. So if you were doing some kind of group meeting or education session, you could use video to have you know, a French language channel for folks and a Swahili language channel. And that's another big positive of the new technology through Zoom. Um, and then in person is still really, a lot of folks preferred way to go. Um, you can see body language. Um, it's almost always more cost effective for a longer appointment than phone or video, which are paid for by the minute. Um, and that matters, <laughs> I assume, for your organization. Um, it can be helpful because you can talk to the interpreter ahead of time. And in-person interpretation, you can provide simultaneous, um, which you might have seen. I think the most, the, it, the example people think of is like at the UN when people are talking at the same time as the presenter or consecutive, which means one person talks and then the next person talks. So all of these are options. 
Um, but the reason why we're talking about these options is because for me, the, the really question to ask is how do people access your services and how at every single door that you have to your services, how can someone enter that door if they are not speaking English? So here are a few of the doors I think about um, at our agency, right? Folks call the office, people literally walk in our door. Sometimes I receive an email and sometimes people contact us through social media. So I think that my question for all of you to really think about, and maybe you could share examples um, if you have them in the chat, is um, what access, like if someone walks in your door, right? Um, and they aren't speaking English, how do they access your services? How do they talk to you? Does every single person at your program who answers the door know what to do or how to get an interpreter, right? Like what happens if somebody writes you an email in Spanish? How do you respond? What steps do you take? What happens next? So thinking about it as like, what are the access points? How do people re usually reach out to you? Um, and then how do you make, how do you ensure language access at each of those points? It's just one way to frame your plan. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment because I see there's a number of questions in the chat. Apologies. Folks are chatting about um, <laughs> prevention programming and school-based programming okay. and, and um, I'm wondering, and then folks can chime in if I'm not, mm -hmm. um, if you're wondering different things, is mm -hmm. Is education compliance different than um, Title VI um, federal funding compliance for service providers? And as folks are thinking about bringing their prevention programming to schools, what is the role of interpretation and the, the sort of obligation of both the centers and the schools to provide interpretation to students who are English language learners? Sure, so I guess the first question is schools overall are bound to Title VI, but that um, like other school laws that impact schools like special education law, for example, um, have like additional language access requirements, right? So, you know, an interpreter is absolutely required in an IEP meeting at a school because of special education law in addition. Um, so I do find that schools are overall more compliant, but that in meetings like that, but might struggle with things like um, figuring out how to do new student intake in another language if they've never had a student who speaks another language before. Um, I think that, for example, if you were to do an education session in a school and you were bringing the programming with you, um, I don't know if I've encountered a scenario where outside where a school has provided interpreters for outside programming and that comes to them. Um, that would be very surprising to me if a school paid for interpretation. And I would venture a guess that you would need to bring an interpreter with you if you were to do an in-school education session. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, students are absolutely really lost. Um, some districts in, the, in our state have their own interpreter staff on call and have a lot easier access. And some school districts are really in a learning process of how to provide more meaningful access all the time. I would say it's really, really varied. And because interpretation is expensive, which we're gonna talk about in our next slide, I do see that schools often will prioritize it for those moments it feels like, like they absolutely have to, um, like a parent meeting for a special education meeting, um, but not for every single service, which I'm not saying is in compliance. <laughs> um, but again, they just have to be taking meaningful steps. Um, and so, yeah, often folks aren't quite there yet. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your feedback all. Um, so briefly about budgets, because I do know that it matters. I also work for a nonprofit. Um, <laughs> so the thing is language access is expensive and it has to be written into every budget by directors. So for me, it means every single grant that I apply to, there's an interpretation line always, all the time. And um, how you figure out maybe how much should be in that line. Um, 
I made this little graph of some things to consider when you're thinking about maybe how much money you need to spend. And there are things like the number or proportion of folks who are li who with limited English proficiency who you serve or who you could serve, um, the frequency with which you serve those folks, um, what resources are available in your organization. Um, and then as you're building your program or maybe even building your budget, what are the most absolutely most important activities that you need to make sure are accessible? And then how can you build out from there? Um, and then on a practical level, uh, I think it's important to have a conversation as a team about what your instructions are for when to utilize phone versus video versus in person. They do have different costs. Um, and that could be something that, you know, you just make a choice about as a program. So at all possible, we use in-person interpreters, mostly because clients seem to like it better, but also it is absolutely less expensive than always using the phone, for example. <laughs> um, so if you can schedule interpreters, that's, you know, maybe one something your program will prioritize. And then briefly, the thing about translation, so written translation, um, is that it is a one-time cost. When you translate a document, it is translated. Translation is also expensive, um, but it's not something you do over and over again once you've translated like one vital document. Just a few notes about budget. I know everyone's budget is different. I also know that this is a huge cost, but um, again, it's something we always ask for in grants. That's one way to think about it too. It's always a line item. One of the commitments Nikasa is making is to be the holders of vital documents and translate the vital documents. So those are the things that we assess by we, I mean all of us, as being necessary to do your work day to day with um, clients. And so again, as a means of like efficiency and sustainability, you all are are more than welcome to translate and produce whatever you want at your own agencies. And at Mikasa, we will hold some outreach materials, um, release form, which we're working on, survey, which we're working on. And so as you come across vital documents that you think other centers would need to be translated as well, please reach out to me because we want to support that and be able to distribute them statewide. So you all aren't like translating in your corners. Again, you might have specialized programming or things you really wanna do in house, which is great. But if you have something that you think might be a vital document other folks could use, um, let us put it in our budget and figure it out. That's great, Katie. And then I guess the other thing about translation is it's a per word cost. So you can also think about especially if you're doing like advertising information, like what's the most concise way to get our program out there? Um, can we use less words or make it more visual? Um, and that's another way to think about translation as well. Okay, so just a little bit about working effectively with interpreters, and then we're gonna go into our first breakout group um, to do a little practice. So as the provider, you have a lot of control over how your work with interpreters goes, and it definitely takes practice. Um, an interpreter is a really skilled individual in the room with you, and as much information as you can give them ahead of time uh, will really help them do their work better. So you can do this a few ways. Um, when you request an interpreter, you can always give the agency requesting um, a little bit of, of info about the appointment, even just what kind of appointment it is. Um, you know, if it's going to be a first meeting um, or if it's going to be you and three other providers and also the survivor, just a bit more about the context. Um, you can schedule the interpreter to come a few minutes before and give them that information then. Um, it's really important as the provider that you're greeting the survivor first and talking in the first person. Right, so this is something that I see all the time that someone will be working with an interpreter and they'll look at the interpreter and say, you know, tell her that the first thing we're going to do is the intake. Instead of just like looking at the client or survivor and saying, the first thing we're going to do together is the intake. Um, 
that language really matters for, of course, building relationship with the survivor, but it also is better for the interpreter um, because it's their job to say exactly what you're saying. So if you speak in first person, the interpreter is also then speaking in first person um, to the person who needs the service. That makes sense. This is something that, you know, if we were in person would be a little easier to demonstrate. Again, just really try hard to do first person and to really talk to, to the survivor, to the person you're working with. So the interpreter can do their job, which is interpret exactly what you're saying. Um, it's helpful to speak slowly and to take pauses. Um, we're gonna do an activity in a moment that shows a little bit more about why pausing is really important. But um, again, interpreting is a hard job. And you know, if you speak for five minutes straight, the interpreter is not going to be able to say exactly what you just said um, with verbatim. <laughs> um, folks' memory retention is great. That's a part of the job, but pausing really helps people, interpreters do their job better. Um, it's important to avoid idioms if you can um, for a couple of reasons. Idioms are really different in every single language and country around the world. Um, and it also just, they aren't a clear way to explain what you're saying. So what could happen is if you accidentally use an idiom, um, so you know something you say all the time, the interpreter might just ask you to clarify or say it a different way, which is completely fine. But I think as you're, it, if you're thinking, I think you can get better at practicing <laughs> not using idioms as you work with interpreters over time. Just thinking about what words you're actually saying, what the meaning of those words are, if the meaning of those words might be translatable. Many things aren't fully translatable or exactly translatable across languages. So sometimes you and the interpreter might just have to work out how to best explain a concept. Um, it's important to go one person at a time. So you speak, the interpreter speaks, survivor speaks, and back and forth. Um, and sometimes one practice you could do is asking, asking the survivor to repeat back really important instructions or something that you absolutely want to make sure it was understood um, so that it, that message can come back through the interpreter to you. So um, we are going to, I think, go to this activity. So. Um, what this activity is, is just a chance for you to understand a bit more about um, kind of best practices for the speech pattern that is helpful for an interpreter in terms of pausing. So when we go to breakout rooms in a moment, um, you're going to need to assign people a role. Um, there's roles A, B, and C. Um, and A is going to be the provider. B is going to be the interpreter, and C is just going to be the observer. Um, for the purpose of this activity, the interpreter is also going to speak English, but just going to be repeating exactly what the provider says. So when you get your instructions in your breakout room, um, just the provider should be looking at the instructions, and it's the interpreter's job to just repeat back exactly what the provider says. Um, again, in English, so it's going to sound like English and then English again. I want the observer to just notice what's happening. You're going to do this activity two times. Um, and then we'll come back as a group and debrief. Are there any questions? Um. Oh, Casey says, it strikes me that many of those best practices of ways communicating would apply to every person we are serving, whether an interpreter is present or not. Definitely. <laughs> Some of it feels really intuitive, and yet I've certainly been in places where the, the, I don't know whether it's anxiety or like a desire to get all the information you can in there or to get something over with where that none of those things happen or someone speaks to the interpreter and not to mm -hmm. the person. Um, I see that happening a lot. Um, so anyway, that was just a, um, someone else is saying like, there's some storms happening up north, so we might get yeah. people kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so now is time for you all to open your 
activity one that you got in your email earlier today, or I just put a link in the chat where you could get it in our SharePoint. So again, we're going to put you in breakout rooms. There's going to be a, a talker, an interpreter, and an observer or two. Or two. So yeah, your job, or two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so your job is to assign each other that and then go through the script, right? Yep. Um, with just the person who is the the provider talking and no one else looking at the, the script. Is that right, Hannah? That's exactly right, Katie. And uh, let's give folks, I think probably 10 minutes. Awesome. Welcome back, folks. Um, all right, so I've never fully done this on Zoom before, so I'm really curious to know what happens and if any folks are up for sharing uh, what happens in your group or what you noticed. Maybe any observers, because this is really your moment to shine in your role. Um, in our group, the first time around, um, she could not repeat everything or even much after the first sentence because, um, you know, she just gave this long list and stuff. Um, the second time was much better, but she still, a couple of times, said the same thing, but in a different way. I, mm -hmm. And by the end of it was, um, had some hard time remembering and stuff. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Well, I'm glad the activity worked for at least that group. So awesome. Thank you. Um, anything else that folks want to add? One of the things that we talked about and noticed was it was even challenging with just some of the longer of the shorter snippets and trying mm -hmm. to remember. Um, and Inez pointed out this, I, this, this fact that if you even stray for one second, if your mind goes anywhere else for one second, like that you're, you've lost everything that you're trying to listen to. And I was reflecting on how I take so much um, in watching body language and watching mm -hmm. like somebody's lips move all at the same time. And so that was distracting. Even as it was, I was a, an observer, I was trying to think about how I would be doing as an interpreter and whew, it's very challenging. Yeah, it's a hard job. <laughs> and we weren't e even switching. There wasn't any of that having to reprocess to a different language. Right. I was just listening to English, which is my mother tongue talking in English. Like there was no other kind of brain function that had to happen. I just needed to repeat back everything that was said to me. And it was just like, you what? I can't. Um, I mean, I've already had massive respect for interpreters, but like it's exponential at this point because yeah. I am a circus car when it comes to talking and presenting stuff. So I can't imagine having to like, there's that. As an observer, like, um, I have seen, um, and, you know, um, like, in our group, we, you know, did well that the first, you know, um, like, posing is important for the provider, like, that, that's what I observe, like, and because, because this is what I have seen in practical, like, as a translator, like, mm -hmm. um, if the provider didn't pose, um, will, like, it will take long, like, the sentence will be, make it lost. Yeah. Like, you know, the translator will translate the faster path, you know, like, but um, the very important thing is like, and I share with my group is like, you know, a uh, translator can also ask to post, the, ask the provider to post it so that they, you know, um, convey a great message to the, to the client. So, um, but definitely like both in each sentence, like just introducing the faster path and both in, and going to the second path is very important. For the mm -hmm. client to understand, um, and you know, as a translator, that you know, I if the provider didn't post, I would ask, you know, that's why did you know before? So, yeah. also mm -hmm. the provider can translate it. I don't know, Hannah, if that's right, you know, like the translators can ask both. In Absolutely, the okay. provider didn't post. Absolutely, Norta, and we're going to talk in a moment about some signs of professional interpreting, and I think that's definitely one of them that the interpreter makes sure that they are getting the message and asks for what they need to make sure that the message is being heard. Um, but I think even to what Bridget was just saying, um, you have a lot of power as a provider, right, for making sure that interpretation goes well. And 
one of the number one things you can do is make sure that you're pausing and make sure that your message is clear. Um, interpreting is already a really hard job for so many reasons, right? Um, you are a third person in a scenario that often can be really emotionally taxing. Um, you're translating or you're interpreting from one language to another one. The memory retention and focus is very key to your work. And as a provider, you can make it easier for folks um, by you know, pausing in your sentences, pausing to even check in to make sure it's going well for the interpreter. Um, and that really is a best practice. You can also tell them, you can talk to an interpreter ahead of time about the appointment. And um, you even can talk to the interpreter after um, to you know, make sure, again, like to even talk about your practice, like how it went for you as a provider, not about the content. Um, anything else folks need to add about that activity before we move on? Looks like Bridget has a also like someone else. <laughs> um, like, um, okay, are you talking? Sorry, I don't want to. <laughs> we both talked about it. Go talking. ahead, Nerta, and then Bridget had her hand raised. Oh, okay, so. Um, what Kate said also was not, I think, in the activity, but when you mentioned, like, um, if the provider is directly talking to the translator and not, you know, addressing the, the client, also that one, it can also be, like, um, translators, you can, they can arrange the position of sitting, like, when they, yeah. before they start, the so that one also can happen, so that the translator is facing the provider and also, mm -hmm. is, you know, in between and also direct to the client so that so that so there's a position of arranging translation. Translators interpreters do that too. Like if I go into the room and I you know I arrange, you know, I tell the provider like which way do you wanna I can sit here and translate so we can all both, you know, get mm -hmm. the information so that we pass the information to them. So that one they can also do that. Yep. Absolutely. Go for Bridget. This doesn't necessarily have to do with um, that activity, but I'm wondering about like, so when we're talking about emotionally charged stuff in yeah. another state that I've worked in and I worked with certain translator interpreters on a regular basis, like on a weekly basis, um, we had the practice of checking in with those interpreters afterwards yeah. because some of the content that we would talk about was pretty graphic and pretty hard. Um, that is still best practice. Is that true? Making sure that we have, I just, because some of the stuff that we're talking about is, is difficult. And then kind of, you know, knowing the interpreter that you're working with and making sure that there's that relationship. Um, yeah. I mean, I think from my perspective of supporting interpreters, yes, but I wouldn't want to, I don't know if in your field there's if there is something else, but if there's another best practice that I need to be cognizant of there. <laughs> and again, that was in a different state and I don't yeah. know that that, <laughs> I, I would assume that we would follow that practice yep. here in Maine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it, it before like prepping time and debriefing time is best practice and should be paid for and covered in that like interpreter session. So if someone interprets for an hour, but you use half an hour of their time to prep and half an hour to debr debrief that that's work time and, and it should be part of it. And I um, certainly, and I think too, using the same interpreter, if that client wants it mm -hmm. and that person's available can can be awesome and then Absolutely. save you a little bit of time because you don't have to offer context, never mind supporting that person. Well, one thing that I encountered was that the interpreter would learn my idioms and be able to say, oh, this is what she means because yeah. I, you know, and she also, I, so I was working in the West Coast. I was working in Seattle and had my South Jersey accent and she mm. was able to like that so interpreting English, like what is she saying when she's saying that word? She's not yep. saying the same thing. And I think that's a really, but at the same time, not wearing out those interpreter and causing burnout yep. um, is super duper important. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. And right, so interpreters are speaking in first person all day, right? So if they're doing work where they're talking about trauma all the time, they're talking about trauma in the first person. 
Right. Mm-hmm. So that's just, it's very, very wearing. And um, as much as like even us as an agency try to do interpreter support work or work on trauma informed care for themselves, um, because a lot of interpreters, you know, work for a huge number of agencies or it's their seventh job. Um, many folks might not have time for that. So any little right debrief or supports you can build in is absolutely best practice. Mm-hmm. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I also, it was Jordan's comments also, that sounds like Fosia said in their group is that summarizing is not interpreting is also a really important comment um, that, <laughs> right, um, interpreting is supposed to be exact like source to target or exact meaning if the word is not, not the exact and that right summarizing is not the same as that. And I can see why that would come up in this activity that you would revert to summarizing if you didn't catch all the words, definitely. One of the things that came up in mm-hmm. one of the things that came up in our group was when you were talking about um, not using idioms in language, and so using the word immunizations. And we might say, "Did you get your shots?" or "You need to get your shots." And they might think you're going to the doctor and you're going to get shot, um, or what you know, whatever that nuance might be. And so um, yeah. we were talking about that, and yeah, it was pretty interesting. Our group was um, pretty interesting. <laughs> we had some some good conversation about it. That's so great. I'm really glad it worked. And also it just can be that sometimes um, the first word you use like, isn't the right one and you need to come up with another way to say it. So it can be interpreted. Uh, yeah, yeah. Also like when they are uh, like when someone is new, when they just arrive up, mm-hmm. like if you say in shot, they shot is only known in, in a bullet. Like so in that right. case, like what um, you know, previous person say, the other group discuss, it can be like if they're just a new, they only think in Short. The English pra- phrase and words in English is different yeah. from our, like, you know, the country we came from, and, and you know, uh, in US. So some like when I was, you know, the first time, yeah, like people will say like form it, like you know, form it, and in America they say with the person throw up, you know. So it's mm-hmm. a learning process. It takes long for some person like, what does that mean? Like, so <laughs> it takes <laughs> it takes the translator what? to ask the provider again, what is that? So. It's like okay. when people first arrive, they <laughs> that language, raising that language is different for them. They, yeah. Absolutely, thank you. And like you were saying earlier, Nota, um, there's a number of ways that interpreters making sure that they're getting it right is extremely professional, right? So I just wrote down a few uh, signs of a really professional interpreter. Um, so like correcting themselves if they've made a mistake, great sign. Um, asking for you to repeat things means that, you know, they want to make sure they're getting it right. Um, Being really clear if they're speaking on their own own behalf. So for example, saying something like, um, the interpreter would like to clarify, or the interpreter has a question. Um, Another really good sign of a professional interpreter. Um, And then just, you know, professional interpreters, again, are trained. And so it's the role of the interpreter to manage the flow of conversation and maybe ask for more pauses if it's not working for them. Well, thank you, Hannah. That's what you, what, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> that's what you train us. So <laughs> the translator yeah, was trained, yeah, they were trained and, you know, to ask, you know, clarification. And <laughs> so I get used to that. And that's what I mostly do. Like I, I stop if the provider is, you know, not person. I, you know, clarify if I'm not or if the client is not understanding, I make sure mm-hmm. I ask the client, you know, Somali, when we are translating, has a different mm-hmm. dialogue. Yeah. Like some um, client I'm translating may not understand. They may ask me, Nurta, what do you mean that? Like, maybe the dialogue I'm speaking is different. Like, for mm-hmm. example, if I don't know that word, they can ask me that. And also, if I, you know, um, the same thing, like I make sure because if she's, you know, if someone is not getting the dialogue I am using, then if they ask me, I make sure I ask them, do you understand what I mean? Like, that's yeah. what I don't say. Do you understand how I translate? So I also ask that so that they, I make sure they understand correctly. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a great best practice. Absolutely. I mean, it's the role of the provider and then in collaboration with the interpreter to make sure that the client gets the information that they need. Um, So clarifying as much as possible, absolutely best practice for all involved. Um, I think we're gonna transition for our our last minutes together um, to talking a little bit more about some challenging situations that come up um, when interpreting that are a little bit more related to 
like power dynamics and situations than to the technical parts of interpreting. Um, so um, there are a lot of challenges um, when trying to provide language access. And I'm gonna give some examples, but mostly what we're going to do is spend time in groups talking about three different scenarios that um, Katie actually provided to me from all of you. Um, but in Maine particularly, a challenge to be aware of is that communities are pretty small and that there are a lot of connections and relationships, right? So I'm from a town of 2,000 people, right? If I had to have one of those 2,000 people in the room with me every time I had a doctor's appointment, that could be really uncomfortable and challenging for me, right? Um, so it's really important to be aware that there are all kinds of connections and that people relationships to each other could be really complicating um, if you're hiring interpreters, like in-person interpreters from the same community. Um, there are all kinds of different cultural norms and values to be aware of. Um, what we like to tell our interpreters is that um, they absolutely, they are, you are always opting into an appointment, right? You never have to take an appointment. Um, but sometimes folks do end up in uncomfortable scenarios. Um, I find that this comes up a lot around like death and dying and different um, religious or cultural practices folks have where interpreting can be really uncomfortable around those subjects. Um, so just being aware that that could be a challenge is important. Um, in different situations, there can be community pressures and taboos around specific topics, definitely in the field that you work in. Um, for me, this often comes up around like healthcare and birth control. Um, because we do a lot of medical screening. Um, again, I think a challenge to be aware of is that being multilingual is not the same, same as being a professional interpreter, um, both because the skill is hard, as you all just learned, like the actual skill of repeating back, um, but also because fluency really matters. So especially if you're in a medical environment or a court environment and the language needs to be really precise, those things aren't the same. Um, and then the other one is just that families have really different power dynamics and that age can really impact how interpreting happens um, and who is holding power in the situation, right? If there's a younger interpreter and older clients or if there's an older interpreter and younger client, um, that can really change who has power in the situation. Um, so the reason why then in professional interpretation is really important because it helps you have some control over the power dynamic um, because you're hiring someone and hopefully you've talked with the client about their needs around um, being over the phone, about gender, age, languages. Um, it can really help with trust building <laughs> um, and it also can really hurt trust building to have an interpreter uh, who isn't quite meeting the client's needs. Um, and you really can't get informed consent without professional interpretation um, in the way that it's required for all of the work that we all do together. So all of those, I think about these three pieces of language access of like, why are we doing it? And what do we have to consider as really the most vital, the most important to keep building trust, to make sure that the client or survivor has all of the power they possibly can um, and to make sure there's informed consent. Um, you talk a little bit, Hannah, about the role of confidentiality for interpreters. Definitely. So confidentiality um, is required for an interpreter um, in a number of different ways um, in terms of their professional role. So even just at our agency, it's part of the code of conduct that folks sign. Um, for all medical situations, interpreters are born to are um, subject to HIPAA in the same way that a medical provider is, um, absolutely. And if there was ever a situation where you were worried about an interpreter breaking confidentiality or there was an issue, you absolutely should call the, pro the provider or who you requested the interpreter from um, and make sure that they know so it can be addressed immediately. Um, we take it really, really seriously. Um, and it's a huge deal if an interpreter um, breaks confidentiality. Um, so the two like bounds, if you will, I would say are like the agency itself and the rules they hold the interpreter to, um, and then HIPAA regulations as well. Um, um, 
Then there's Susie, I want to make sure I understand your question, so clarify as needed. But Susie asks, um, is it acceptable to write down or type the message into a note taking app before translating? Susie, am I unmuted? You, there am, you are. Am I unmuted? Okay, there I am. Yeah. Um, here, I'll put the video on so you can see me. What I was doing, I tapped into some skills that I have from a previous job, and as Jeb was reading, and I'm sorry if this was already addressed, I got kicked out of the room for a moment. As Jeb was, was reading the provider's information, I was keying onto my notepad app what was being said so that I could trans translate it back correctly. Is that something that is acceptable or is that a breach of confidentiality because I'm recording something about the, uh, the patient and the provider that actually isn't mine? I would say as long as you delete it in real time, that note taking is really professional, but I don't know about the electronic thing in your field, as long as it goes away afterwards, the record, but we tell folks that jotting notes as to help you get it right is very professional. Okay. I don't know, do you have an electronic record policy that needs to be added to that, Katie? I mean, provided you can just delete it before you even exit the room um, and you don't yeah. hold on to it, then I think it can be considered yeah. note-taking equivalent of shredding a paper, right? Right, right. Um, and there was a question about what is the um, what is the mandated reporting role of an interpreter? Good question. Thank I you. That's a great question. Thank um, you. What we teach folks is that it needs to, it like goes along. Well, so two things, I guess, I don't know how often you're doing reporting for minors. I don't know how often you work with minors, I guess. I mean, we, everyone here is the skilled mandate reporter. It comes up. Right. Um, so what we often teach interpreters is that they need to basically be following the rules of the place that they're working. So if they're the conduit, right, um, it's, so an example is if a, I think this is how it would most often come up. The client says something to the interpreter and then says, don't tell them that right? That comes up all the time, right? If you're in a role where like the provider is a mandated reporter, then the interpreter needs to report that, right? I've had a situation though where the interpreter has felt so uncomfortable in real time and like called us as the agency afterwards and been like, this is what happened. I didn't know what to do. Mm. Um, and the best practice is the interpreter should make sure that the provider knows, even if it's right after the appointment, like should report. Um, but there have absolutely been times that the interpreter reports to like me or their supervisor and then we report um, if the interpreter just was really like overwhelmed in the moment. I, so again, um, I actually don't think the interpreter themselves is not a mandated reporter, but they're required to interpret all of the things that are said, right? Right. That right. makes sense. So it's not exactly what their role is, but if a client tells them something, it should be said by them. Like, and because yeah. it's part of the introduction of the provider's job to tell the clients or the survivor that everything that they say is going to be interpreted. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I have seen that, um, you know, like a lot yep. that, uh, like, it's, like, it didn't happen to me, you know, um, as a translator before, like, mm -hmm. if the provider is there, like, you know, like you say, you know, um, mandated reporter, it didn't have yeah. to, to report anything or see anything that I have to report. But, you know, like um, if, as you say, the provider mentioned in the before, uh, the beginning that everything will be translated. And yeah. you know, I pass to the client and I say, everything stayed in this room will be translated. So, yeah. so people will not like think if they, if they know that everything they say will be translated. And if they say that I have to, as a translator, then I have to translate. Mm -hmm. so that, um, of all the things that we've sort of brought up today, that's one of the things that's not in our new model policy. So what I would like to do is follow up with directors, but also Hannah, so we can put some language in there to address the role of mandated reporting for the interpreter. Um, the other thing is about adding debrief time. Um, yeah. So that's two points to Bridget because she brought up both of them. <laughs> so, um, so again, as you 
are thinking through applying to this to your work day to day and have questions, bring them up because I want to make sure they're addressed in the model policy and that we chat about them here. Yeah. Um, there's one more question. Do you have time or do you want to do scenarios and return to it? Um, I will briefly answer this question. Um, so it says, is there any room for the interpreter to inform providers about culture norms or values if they feel the provider is saying something that may be offensive? Um, I think that the professional way for an interpreter to do that is just to make very clear that they're speaking as themselves. Like the interpreter would like to note that this language might be challenging because of X reason, or the interpreter would like to let you know that blank. So as long as the interpreter is saying it from their own point of view, making very clear it's not the client's opinion, I think that's the professional way that you can handle that or do that. Um, but it's not their job. So uh, as a provider, um, you could you, you know you could ask them, but it's also not the interpreter's job to answer you. Right, so sometimes like putting the interpreter in a pressured situation to say, you know, like, how am I doing? Or like, did it go well? It's like not exactly their role. If you build rapport with someone over time, like we were talking about earlier, I think that's a little different, but it's not the interpreter's job to culturally broker um, is their role. Um, okay, I do think that we probably should go to scenarios. Um, what I would say based on time is we might do it kind of quickly, but I think that what comes from your small groups could just, again, help your policy in the future or things that we feel like we need to address. So we have three scenarios that all came from you. Um, we're gonna put you into small groups. Let's do, let's maybe even do like only 10 minutes together so that we can come back. So it's a little bit faster, but then you can hear from each other. Um, so Katie, right, we're gonna do groups and then try to assign folks a scenario, right? So this is the second <laughs> word document. Yes, so this yeah. is the second yeah. activity number two. <laughs> and I just linked it in the chat. You're mm -hmm. gonna go into six groups. Groups one and two, do scenario one. Groups three and four, do scenario two. <laughs> groups five and six, do scenario three. If you don't remember, it's fine. <laughs> We will, we will make do. And um, I would recommend choosing someone to facilitate or sort of hold the space so that folks feel like you're using your time well. So again, you're going to be assigned randomly to a group. First two, two groups do scenario one. Second two groups do scenario two. Third um, pair do scenario three. And you can always call upon us if you don't remember. Sound good? We'll give you 10 minutes. Um, and I would like to welcome Fatuma. Fatuma from Immigrant Resource Center of Maine was able to join us for a few. We are grateful for her time and expertise and will be part of the scenario chat. Great. Welcome Fatuma. Thank you. Um, all right, so we don't have very long left together. So I think what we'll do is spend a little bit of time with each scenario. Um, we'd love to hear from each group. Um, and then Fatuma and I can jump in also with our thoughts about each one. So um, the first one is that you're at the police station with a survivor and you know it's their job to provide an interpreter and they haven't done it. Um, so wondering what steps you might take to ensure their survivor has language access um, and what you would do. So the two groups who did scenario one, what do you want to add or what do you want to bring up about this scenario? Um, well, uh, from the IRCM perspective, we, we come from a very unique position. And I was saying this in the group that um, we are the best of both worlds. So we have an understanding of the systems and we can navigate and understand the procedures that goes into beginning those steps and reporting and things like that. Um, and at the same time, we have that cultural and linguistic competency um, for that individual, uh, the survivor or um, the survivor and uh, survivor and victims. Um, and so they feel more comfortable revealing information to us because they see um, themselves in us and they see uh, someone that understands them versus maybe an interpreter that's coming from a more um, 
that's maybe coming from a different background or doesn't really understand where they're coming from. Um, so we have uh, survivors feel a lot more comfortable reporting and coming forward with information and really participating in uh, the steps that go into, um, into the reporting process because of those things. So um, yeah, that's <laughs> I'm rambling a bit, but yeah, that's uh, something that I taught brought up. Thanks, Akisa. What else came up for folks when you were talking about this scenario? We had also said in our group that it's likely if there it's the police station, then it's probably um, pretty important that there are policies that are followed because it would be part likely part of an investigation. Um, so that it should be on the police department to make sure that those policies are followed in the way that they need to for an effective investigation. And so um, another question was, what other resources do you have? And so we brainstormed a little bit about that, but really in the end, I think we backed off that a little bit um, in trying to be creative and problem solve because it, we felt like it was so important that it be followed to the policy that the police department should and would have because of the investigation piece. We yeah. wouldn't want to compromise any elements of evidence because policies weren't followed. Yeah, absolutely. And it really could just be like to your point that it's the job of the advocate in that moment to really push them to find the policy or find someone that knows the policy if they don't know the policy. So. Um, you know, I find that at every office, there's someone who knows how to utilize interpreters and it, every person might not know the policy, but someone will. Like dispatch uses, for example, phone interpreting all the time, but an individual officer might not know, have that same skill. So maybe the kind of demand or question, like, can you find someone who knows the policy or can you find someone um, who knows how to call interpreter an interpreter for your department, right? And Hannah, I was going to add, I was going to add, I think at that moment, um, you're finding yourself both helping and supporting the survivor, but also educating that police department yeah. around language access and, and, and what needs to happen. And so if I were in, you know, in this particular scenario, I think f first and foremost, the survivor has to get services that they need. And so if, if, cause you don't know what the situation is. You know, I was in this training right now and I got a call from um, Westbrook PD. There was a crisis, I had to get out. Um, and so I, I think walking the police department through a process and so to Amanda's point, I think, yes, there is mm -hmm. um, information that have to be safeguarded, but if we were to walk through the their process and get them to get an interpreter, someone somewhere knows a policy. They must have, this is not the first time that they've used interpreter services. So, you know, being the advocate on site, I think advocating for that survivor to get what they need is essential at first because mm -hmm. you can't turn them away. You, you don't know what the needs are. So I think to get to know what their needs are, it's important for you to advocate and push the police department to figure out an interpreter. If that doesn't work, if they don't have any interpreters available and language access is not um, a, an option for them, then inquire from the police department, if we were to provide an interpreter who's trained, can they utilize that? Because I think they they know on the other side what, what can be compromised, what, what cannot be. So I think if you are to negotiate that and get an interpreter, get through this scenario first, get the survivor what they need, and then turn back to the police department and say, do you have a language access policy? Yeah. What is your interpretation policy protocols? What do you do? You need, a, I mean, Hannah, you and I did this a million mm -hmm. times. You need to do, you need to have an interpreter training. You need to do this so that they can also get accountable, held accountable. Because this is a very serious um, situation for a police department to say, I'm not so sure what you're talking about when it comes to language access. 
it's just not acceptable. Absolutely. Thanks, Fatima. I think about it too as a potential SART team meeting conversation, a potential outreach conversation where you say, and you can use this as an excuse, <laughs> we're working on our language access policy and we're wondering what it looks like when X, Y, and Z and sort of doing that work ahead of time on your end um, and to sort of flag it for police partners, for community partners to make sure you're clear on who does what um, and as a means to sort of start that dialogue and see and um, to see what what would happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think just so you can have a few minutes in each scenario, we're going to go to the next one. But that again sounds like something we can follow up in your policies as well. Um, so the second one is a bit of a different kind of challenging scenario, which is that a survivor comes to an appointment and they have a multilingual family member with them, and they really want their family member to interpret because it makes them feel safer. And I'm just curious what you talked about and what you said you would do. And then I had some follow-up conversations in your activity around power dynamics and what might come up there. So curious to hear what folks have to say about this one. Well, this one, like, um, it's um, because of, like, uh, in our group, we discussed, like, how um, the family um, interpreter that they're using may not be uh, professional and, you know, may not be conveying or, you know, um, the client may not get the help they need because of, like, if the um, conversation is not passed from the provider to the um, client and the conversation got lost or, you know, like, um, if, um, if the family member is holding information to pass on to the provider, so... Um, it may interfere the um, the provider's help the client. Um, we also discuss about like how um, some um, some providers have a policy of like they are not using family members as a translator, and they uh, request the translator, and the translator will help the client like you know, talking to the client and saying, oh, um, we have um, you know translator who is you know trained and can translate well for us and if you help and so client in that way if the provider talks to the client that way the client may change their mind. Also I have seen other uh, scenario that you know um, provider orders translator, the request translator, translator is in the room and the family member can also is in the room so that like um, um, the provider you know requests or they prefer, you know, the translator to be there to in case, you know, the client is not, you know, um, understanding the family translator or in case, you know, there's mistranslation. So that we come up with yeah. that. Thanks, Marcia. I think that idea specifically around saying, you know, it's the policy that we work with the professional interpreter is definitely a strategy. Um, what other challenges came up for folks around this one? Or what do you want to add about what makes this, what might make this specifically difficult. We talked in this, I was, I was also in the same group, we talked with, um, we talked about what it could be like if the, the family member who's wanting to be the interpreter refuses or pushes back against having an outside interpreter um, and how um, to buckle down and Fazia made, made some really good points of how important it is to make sure that there's an outside interpreter um, and to keep pushing back against that. Um, and when I, one way of, if, if we do, if the survivor and their family member decide to leave the office, they don't want to have an outside interpreter to make sure that there is an option to call on the phone where that person might be able to have some privacy and an interpreter at a later point. Absolutely. Thanks, August. I think those are great ideas also. I'd like to add also some point. Um, mm -hmm. As a um, non, uh, we have a, a lot of uh, clients who don't speak English and, and it, to have the exact word of the person or the survivor we need, we must have uh, an, an independent uh, 
a translator or interpreter. Otherwise, uh, there is, even uh, the, when um, they sing, then they don't want uh, uh, the interpreter. You don't know if it is the survivor or if it is the family member, since yeah. the, the survivor is not even speaking the language. To have uh, 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 pushing back with the policy can uh, give uh, the provider uh, a, a door or a bridge to uh, reach and help that uh, victims or, or survivor uh, or hear their, walk, that their own war. Mm -hmm. we, we see uh, a lot of victims who who been uh, uh, use uh, their own uh, um, abuser as an interpreter and and as a provider or as a provider we need we must uh, uh, give ser uh, services to the victims and to have that we must understand and speak directly with the victims yeah that's a great point that's it Fatuma. and yeah. hannah can i just echo what fuzi just said i think it's important for particularly region with sexual assault um needs and that context where um you know, it's normalized and, and particularly, in, you know, in our communities, I think it's very important to use an outside interpreter, both to protect the survivor, but for us to understand what the need of a survivor is. Um, a lot of times, even these family members may not necessarily be family members. They may be the abuser, they may be the neighbor, they may, but you as a provider, especially you as a mainstream provider, you may not be able to understand the dynamics that's going on uh, within between the two individuals. And you can't pick the body language, you can't, you don't come from that cultural lens, right? And so it is very important to be safe and to do your work in a way that supports the survivor. I think if you went, came back to say, it's our policy to use a trained interpreter even the family member will back off. Now there's situations where the survivor may need a family member for support, but you as a trained advocate, as a trained professional can pick on that. You know, if, if it's a very severe situation where the survivor really needs a lot of support, then you call that judgment. You make that judgment. You, you, you do what you need to do. But I think even us, I think it's very, we often will use, interpreters who are independent um, or if in our agency you're related to someone or there's a conflict then another person within the agency will serve that person just to make sure that the survivor needs are met and, and that we are able to support that. Yeah, absolutely thank you so much Fatuma and Fosia and I think that I know that we're almost out of time but you both um, brought up something that is actually really present in our last one which is that you're with someone and you have become increasingly concerned that the interpreter is interfering with the message. Like you're no noticing that there's disagreement or discord between the interpreter and their survivor in real time. Um, and so as an extension of what Fessy and Fatuma said, right, how in that moment did folks talk about what you might do um, in that moment or what you might do as follow-up to address that situation and make sure that you're hearing the survivor themselves? Well, we, um, we went in all kinds of different directions with this uh, because it's really um, challenging. You don't want to put the, um, the survivor, victim survivor in, a, in an unsafe situation by pointing out that um, she seems worried or scared or um, nervous or all the things. And so we ha had some conversation around that, around how would we do that and how could we do that in a way that wouldn't put her... Um, in, in danger. Um, also, we talked about um, the, uh, we went back to like, what if the interpreter for the um, family is a, a, is a child? Sometimes that happens and they want their child to be there to be their interpreter and how that would be detrimental to that child um, mm -hmm. to have to recount all of the um, graphic sexual details of, of an assault. And so, um, we kind of were all over the place with this question. I don't know that we actually stuck to this, but we did talk about, um, you know, maybe if it was at the hospital, um, going to talk to the nurse manager or a doctor about another 
interpreter or you know yep. who else they might have um, to be able to come in and um, provide some additional clarification around the messaging. Um, this was a really hard one. Uh, the folks in my group, do you guys have anything else to add? No, I think you summed it up really nice, Jenna. Thanks, Jenna. So, Tuma, do you think there's anything else on this one you want to add just before we close up? I know we're almost done. Um, no, Jenna put it together. And I think, you know, this one, the first thing that will come into my head is, um, is there a safety issue? And what can we do differently to make sure that the survivor is safe and also to not aggravate a situation that's already bad, you know, or tensed? Thank you, Jenna. Yeah, absolutely, folks. Um, so I know it's, it's 2.56, but we're almost done today. So I'm sorry to try to rapidly wrap this up. Um, so we probably, we don't have time, I think, to talk about other situations that have been challenging for you all. But um, so Tuma and I are going to be working with Katie in next week to really support all of you in making language access plans. So I think brainstorming, sorry. I think brainstorming about um, what situations you have come across that you want to problem solve that you're looking for policy for will be really helpful um, as you do that with your programs. Um, and yeah, um, it's been really great to spend time with you all today. And I'm looking forward to I'll keep working with you all in next month until the two months. And uh, thank you for inviting us to be with you today. I think that that's my wrap up, Katie. If there's anything else you needed to add, you have a few minutes. Um, the other things we're going to be thinking about are logistics. So making sure you have what you need to know how to like pick up the phone and use the phone and call the mm -hmm. people you need and sort of like the more kind of like and what languages you need in your area. So we're going to we're going to think logistics and application um, in the coming months. So please keep a list of questions and we will be in touch. Thank you to Hannah and Fatuma. Thank you so much to the IRCM staff who were a valuable resource to all of us today. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I will follow up with um, a recording in your email and now in the chat box you have the evaluation. We rely on your feedback to make sure presentations are getting your needs met and are useful to you. So please, please, please fill it out. I'm going to keep pasting in the chat box just to make sure that you <laughs> pop it in, um, where you're sitting. Um, but you are, are free to go and hopefully we see you in two weeks to talk about um, American Sign Language interpretation. So thank you all. Have a good Tuesday. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.